Hello and welcome to Projector, and on this episode, Shaun of the Dead stars Simon Pegg and Nick Frost reunite alongside Asa Butterfield and Michael Sheen as they try to survive school in Slaughterhouse Rules. Against his wishes, Don Wallace, played by Finn Cole, is sent to the prestigious boarding school Slaughterhouse, where the school's headmaster is nicknamed The Bat, played by Michael Sheen, and becomes roommates with the cynical Willoughby Blake, played by Asa Butterfield. Developing a crush on sick former Clemsy Lawrence, played by Hermione Caulfield, Don doesn't just have bullying prefects like Tom Reese Harris's Clegg to deal with, a nearby fracking site has opened a sinkhole that has released subterranean monsters. Now Don, Willoughby, Clemsy, Isabel Loughlin's K, the Bat, and Simon Pegg's teacher Meredith Houseman must fight to survive the night. Simon Pegg and Nick Frost are one of the screen's great double acts. You, of course, know them for their work with Edgar Wright, including Space, Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, and The World's End. But they've also collaborated on several other films as well, like Paul, The Box Trolls, and The Adventures of Tintin, all of which they've co-starred in together, and they're good friends off-screen as well. So it makes sense they've now opened up a production company together called Stolen Picture. Slaughterhouse Rules is the first film to come out of that new outfit, so it makes sense they also co-star in that as well, to give it a bit more name value. The film is directed by Crispian Mills, who's probably best known as a musician. He's the frontman for the band Cooler Shaker, but he has moved into film direction in recent years. He made his debut with 2012's A Fantastic Fear of Everything, which starred Simon Pegg. And clearly what they were trying to do with this is is try to recapture that Shaun of the Dead horror comedy vibe, but with more of a teen audience. However, the reason that you haven't heard this movie, unlike the other Peg and Frost collaborations, is that it's not very good. It's not very good at all. Slaughterhouse Rules does have a fairly amusing premise. After all, English boarding schools are meant to bring out the next generation of the wealthy, privileged elite, and that's such a hotbed for prejudice, classism, and bullying is the kind of environment that eats people alive. Points out in the dialogue in case you missed it, but what if you flip that? What if you unleash monsters in there and have them eat the rich? That sounds like it would be a lot of fun, except the results here are decidedly not. A big problem with this movie is that even though it's billed as a horror comedy, for the first half of it, the horror element is mostly AWOL, unfortunately. And so what you're left with is a lot of boarding school satire. And I've got to be honest, it wasn't especially interesting. I won't lie, there are a couple of gags that I did laugh at. There's a running gag about how there's a kid named Wooten that gets repeatedly hazed because he doesn't know the school's history. And the prefects refers to themselves as gods, particularly one of them named Clegg, who I'm going to assume is named after the politician because this seems like the kind of movie that would do that just to make a point. And he makes a quote from Caligula very early on in the movie. That got a chuckle out of me. The rest of it, though, just isn't funny, unfortunately. It's not especially amusing, and the film spends so much time setting up the social hierarchy of the school, and it's just not engaging. And what makes it worse is that when it moves into the horror aspect of it, it's completely wasted. There's no point setting up if it has no payoff in the grand scheme of things. And it doesn't help that the main character in the movie, played by Finn Cole, is dreadfully boring himself. He is defined by his class, and you would think that they would mine that for some amusing culture shock jokes. They really don't. It's mostly so the other characters can explain how the school's hierarchy works to him. It's dreadfully dull. He's paired up for most of the movie with Asa Butterfield, who I quite liked in this film. It's clear what they're trying to do with Willoughby Blake as a character, because the first time we see him, he's assassinating a photo of Malcolm McDowell from the classic boarding school satire, If. That's clearly where the film's sympathies lie. But 
Over the course of the movie, I did find this character more than a little bit grating because he is so cynical. It actually becomes just a little bit on the obnoxious side. It's that same note being hit over and over again. What really struck me about this movie is just how disorganized it feels on screen. At points, I genuinely felt like I was watching a filmed version of someone's first draft. They just bashed out over the course of a weekend. The ideas are kind of sort of there but not really and certainly not in any kind of coherent or clear fashion as say a theme there are Chekhov's guns that are established prominently with barely any payoff there are whole subplots that go nowhere it's a mess on screen and I genuinely wondered with the caliber of Peg and Frost attached to it how did this end up being the first film out of their production company. Surely they could attract better than this. The horror element is so badly done that it feels like someone was writing a boarding school satire and then got bored halfway through and just stuck monsters in it. I know that probably wasn't the case, but the film does such a bad job of setting it up. This is in spite of the fact that the film does try to aim for an ominous atmosphere, but it's clueless about it. And in fact, it makes things even worse, quite frankly, because the only signs of something dangerous looming are things like Simon Pegg's teacher walking into Latin class going, I'll be teaching because the original teacher for this class, he died here alone. Is that in any way related to the monsters? No, it isn't. It's just because someone dying. Ooh, atmosphere. The worst example of this is that there is a subplot about a bullied kid that Finn Cole's character is taking the place of who committed suicide. And that plot goes nowhere. It's really saying something when you can say this movie has a really pointless subplot about suicide in it. But here we are. It's purely in the movie to give some kind of atmosphere, some sense that something bad has happened, but does it in any way relate to the monsters? No, it doesn't. Why bring up something as sensitive as this in this kind of movie? It feels tonally all over the place. There are points in this movie where it looks like it could be centrinians. It feels like it's aimed at very young teens, and then it'll go into the horror stuff where people are getting decapitated and blood squirting all over the screen. Who is this supposed to be aimed at? I genuinely don't know. But the one thing that frustrated me beyond belief is that it takes so long to get going. The first hour of this movie is almost entirely monster free. And I spent much of it going, okay, once it gets to that part, it might actually get a little bit of life. And I just kept waiting and waiting and waiting. And I started to get decidedly impatient once it became clear that almost an hour had passed without almost anything remotely interesting happening on screen. And then the horror happened, and things didn't get much better from there. Having already committed the unforgivable sin of wasting our time, including its own, just to give you an idea of how unbalanced this film is, the first hour of it spans a whole term of school time, and then once the horror kicks in, it goes over the course of one night. But once the monsters do finally appear, it does momentarily look like it's improving, not least of which because it's finally becoming the movie that you came here to see. That is as long as you don't ask the question, wait, why am I not being allowed a very good look at these monsters? And why is the camera constantly cutting away? Look, I understand that this is a low budget movie. They had very limited resources. So with that in mind, the fact they chose to use practical effects is really commendable. You can tell that they had actual animatronics on set, things for people to actually react to, because they would have probably used the quick and easy shortcut of just CGIing them in later. And they don't really use a lot of that. There's a couple of CGI shots here and there, but mostly it's practical effects, which I can really respect. However, the results, they're not good. They're really not good. In fact, they're very unconvincing, and it's clear why they were trying to hide them so much in post-production. And it's a lot of it comes down to the design of them. 
They look like the dogs from Ghostbusters, and they're about the same level. And this movie so wishes it was Shaun of the Dead, and that too was done on a limited budget, but it knew how to use it. When the gore effects happen in that film, the camera lingers upon it. You very clearly see it because that's production value. Having to cut every single second makes it look cheaper than it already is and calls attention to it. And what's more, just because you copied a few moves out of the Edgar Wright handbook does not suddenly make you him. Like the whip pan establishing shots or characters suddenly popping up out of the off-screen space. It's less sure the dead and more lesbian vampire killers. Crispian Mills has said in interviews for most of the movie that he considers it to be a distant cousin of the Cornettos. Keep wishing, pal. This movie wishes it was anywhere near the quality of those films. Speaking in terms of the monster attacks, there's only one sequence that I think is genuinely inspired, and that's a sequence where they go to an initiation ceremony and the prefects are all wearing the uh, Roman costumes and speaking in Latin, that's kind of amusing, especially once the monsters start tearing through them. It would have been even better had we actually seen that clearly other than split second shots of blood flying across the screen, but that has far more effect than a load of other sequences where you can barely work out what's happening on screen. The finale is really weak. It's just basically the remaining characters running through catacombs. Where are they going? I don't know what's happening. It's barely lit on screen. And by that point, I was going, please end, please end, please end. Even the name actors give surprisingly bad performances. They're very much supporting players. They're probably on set for maybe a couple of days because they pop up fairly sporadically through the film and disappear for long stretches. And obviously, the reason for this is that Mills directed them very broadly. Just take it as over the top as possible. And when you're dealing with someone like Michael Sheen, who I like as an actor, but boy is he a ham if you give him the opportunity, here, playing the headmaster, the bat, he goes over the top and then some. He really plays this caricature of a caricature of this posh, privileged twit. And he seems to be having fun with it. And I did get a couple of chuckles out of his performance, especially when he shares scenes with his pet dog named Mr. Chips. But he's not really in the film for very long. And you do wish that perhaps he'd maybe been reined in just that little bit with his performance. Simon Pegg easily has the largest role out of the three of them. He gets a whole subplot. He plays a teacher at the school, perhaps the only teacher because he's the only one that we see. His girlfriend is doing aid work in Africa and she is played surprisingly, by an A-list performer in a cameo. Like, I did not expect them to turn up in this movie of all places, and I understand why it might have happened, because she appeared in another movie with Simon Pegg very recently. Obviously, a favour has been called in, but even so, she really distracted me out of this movie, because I didn't expect her, of all people, to pop up in this, literally Skyping in her whole role. Peg spends a lot of this movie drinking himself into a stupor, so much so that he actually falls asleep through a great chunk of this movie. Just as the plot is getting started, his character essentially knocks himself out for a good 20 minutes of the running time, which is really fantastic writing there. Peg, again, like Sheen, is kind of hamming it up a little bit. He's got this kind of affected accent all the way through it. And it seems like he's going to be the main character. He keeps threatening to be the focus of the movie, like he's going to become the leader of the kids and help them out. It seems like the movie half-heartedly tries to work towards that. I gotta be honest, having him wander around carrying a cricket bat, yet another homage to Shaun of the Dead, is again really, really embarrassing. By far the worst of these, though, is Nick Frost. His role seems to be grafted onto the script at the very last minute to give him something to do, and as such, 
He's totally pointless. He plays leader of a group of fracking processors out in the woods, and he's a drug dealer, so it's a constant running joke that he's either selling drugs or he's high on drugs. And the movie establishes a backstory for him to fool you into thinking this character has any kind of point to him. Oh, his brother went missing in the catacombs. What could be down there? What mystery? How does he relate to what's going on? And the answer is... Very tenuously indeed. And you would think, given the movie has Peg and Frost in it, that they would team up at some point. Don't hold a lot of hope out for that. The most time they ever share together is that they share the briefest of moments looking at each other with some kind of vague recognition because, you know, they were in some films together and then they wander off like they're in totally separate stories, because they are. What a waste of getting those two together. You could have done so much more with that. In fact, you could have done so much more with Frost, quite frankly. Frost's role in this movie, he spends the large majority of it stoned on mushrooms, so he's totally clueless. He doesn't know what's going on. In fact, his character so disappears out of the movie, there's a good 40 minute chunk where he was off screen for so long, I thought they just killed him off screen, and then he pops back up, and his final scene in the movie is one of the clumsiest, shoddiest written scenes I think I've seen in a horror movie in quite some time. It really is embarrassing to witness. Like, why is he even in the movie if this is the best you could offer him? Oh, and speaking of fracking, the satire of that is remarkably unsubtle. I don't think anyone could walk out of this movie and not be aware of Mills' opinion on that particular subject. And look, I agree with him, and even I'm going, maybe you want to tone that down just a little bit? Like, the frackers in this movie are depicted as evilly cackling to themselves as they drill into the ground, and it's revealed that they're in some sort of shady conspiracy, and that's even before the scenes where they shirk off phone calls about their safety because they're too busy playing video games. I mean, it's, like, over the top is barely even describing it, quite frankly. It's so exaggerated, so cartoonish, in fact, that it makes one yearn for the relative subtlety of a Captain Planet cartoon by comparison. Considering its pedigree, Slaughterhouse Rules is shockingly bad. The script is shoddily constructed, it's totally tone deaf, the comedy isn't nearly as amusing as it thinks it is, and wildly overplayed, the satire isn't nearly as scathing as it should be, and the horror is handled with frankly ineptitude. I don't think it will satisfy either fans of teen horror or the Cornetto trilogy, which this falls wildly blow the quality of, and I spent a lot of this movie wondering, haven't I seen this done better? Yes, it was Joe Cornish's fantastic Attack the Block, which again dealt with kids having to fight against monsters. That is a far better, far more inspired movie than anything in this. So quite frankly, if you're interested in this movie, go watch that instead, or better yet, watch Shaun of the Dead or any of the Cornetto films, because this is a pale, pale imitation that is by far the weakest collaboration of Peg and Frost to date. Slaughterhouse Rules is a horror comedy that wastes an amusing premise on a truly dire script. One wonders why Peg and Frost chose this to start their production company as it plays like a first draft written over a weekend. The first hour of the film is a tedious ball that takes far too long to get to the horror, and even when it does, it quickly becomes repetitive monster attacks you can barely see because the editing is trying to hide how fake and rubbery they are. Director Crispy and Mill Mills guides the adult cast into very broad performances, with Sheen, Peg, and Frost all being underutilized in roles that drop in and out of the film for long stretches, and the fracking satire is practically moustache twirling. Despite some individual jokes and gore that land, this largely awful romp makes sure the dead feel like so long ago. If you like this review, then you can enroll at my Patreon, where you can see my reviews early among other perks, including access to my Discord server. But until next time, I'm Matthew Buck, fading out.